All right. Thank you very much for the introduction and to the uh, Proof Virtual Seminar Committee for inviting me. I feel honored to be a first speaker in the series. So uh, it's, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, it's a great idea, I think, to put people together like this and connect us. And, and um, you know, this is like a large meeting. It's like quite a few people have already arrived and uh, it's like, a, it's, a, it's a very large meeting. So I'm gonna be talking about propositional proof systems and bounded arithmetic. The first part of the talk is sort of a survey of the area of some of one or two of the older results and this kind of stuff. And then the last part will be some new, new work uh, joint with, uh, with Anupam Das and Alexander Knopp. Um, as I said in the pre-meeting part, uh, if you have questions, please put them into the chat window. Uh, either I will answer them as they come up during the talk or of course at the end of the talk. Um, I think the, the length of the talk is a little flexible, so I can either speed up or slow, slow down and try to meet the 45 minutes requested. Uh, so, uh, but I try to put a little less in the talk than usual just to give more time for discussions. So, um, good, so let's get started. Um, no questions yet, let me see here. So, our setting is the following. We're working in uh, formal theories of weak fragments of piano arithmetic. Uh, this is a theory of, of integers, of course, but it could equally well be viewed as theories of strings, but we'll do it in terms of uh, theories of, in, of integers. And they're first and second order theories. So uh, I said weak, weak fragments, we usually think of second order theories as being quite strong. But these, uh, these fragments are all restricted or limited in some, some ways that, that makes them very small sub-theories even of PRA, of I sigma one. And uh, we look at the two types of consequences of these theories. There's the for all exists consequences, the AE delta not con consequences more or less. Uh, we view these as the provably total functions. If for all inputs X, there exists a, a Y, that y is the out output value of a, of a total function. And then we characterize the computational complexity of functions that can be defined in one of these theories. Uh, so that's pretty common way to go about things. A little less common though, in particular to this area, is we also use the Koch and Paris Wilkie translations to propositional logic. So here we look at the universal cons consequences of a theory. And these are statements that are true for all integers. We translate them into a family of propositional formulas that are tautologies because they're translations of true statements, valid statements into propositional for formulas. These tautologies have proofs in a propositional proof system of some type. And then we get the strength of the propositional proof system is then connected to the uh, theory of arithmetic that we're working with. And uh, the, the, the the roots of this go back to the, the 70s or earlier is that talking about feasibly constructive proofs is a you know, feasibly constructive proof that a function is total should give a feasible method to compute it. And feasibly here means computationally tractable. Uh, a feasibly constructive proof of a universal statement should give a feasible method to verify any given instance. And these things were the second, especially the second one was due to Steve Cook in the mid 1970s was this approach here. So I'm gonna talk about this and we will also, uh, I'll talk at the end about some new systems that uh, work with log space and non-deterministic log space. And we'll talk about that more at the end. All right. So just some pictures first. We'll have in the first order setting, we've got first order theories of bound arithmetic. Uh, and we relate these to the, for all exists, the pi two consequences uh, which are the provably total functions of the theory and the pi one consequences, which are the valid statements that are then translated into propositional logic. So that's sort of the picture of what I just said on the first slide. Um, the next ingredient that goes into this picture is there the computational complexity. So by that, I mean the complexity of computing these functions. Uh, that's going to relate to the provably total functions, but then also there's the propositional proof, proof complexity, which is the relates the pro, the strength of the propositional proof systems that are used to prove the pi one consequences or the translations of the pi one consequences of the theory. So 
there's in general at least very good analogies between the computational complexity and the pro pro propositional proof complexity. It may not be an exact correspondence with theorems relating them, but the analogies are extremely strong. Uh, another ingredient which is in more recent years has come up uh, is propositional proof search. And I've connected this with dotted lines and a little squiggly line here because the connections are not nearly as intimate. The um, propositional proof search has been widely used in SAT solvers recently checking, looking for checking satisfiability of propositional for formulas. And of course, a propositional proof search implicitly uses some propositional proof system. So you can then relate that to the computational complexity of, or the, the, the proof complexity of the system. Um, these are dotted lines or squig squiggly lines because the connections are not all that tight. Um, we don't, in, in, in particular, the stronger a proof system is, the harder it is to search for proofs as a, a general rule. And so in practical propositional proof systems that are searching for proofs, there's you want to get the right trade-off between strength of the system and ease of search. And usually re resolution or things related to that are the right things to search for. But the connections to bounded arithmetic are much weaker, but I still wanted to mention it. So a bunch more lines, everything connects up to everything, and then we move on. So, um, so I just want to first mention one of the very first theories. Uh, this is, I've, I phrased this in terms of the first order theory S12, but a, a lot of what I'm saying was essentially done by Steve Cook even earlier for the equational theory of PV, um, which stands for polynomially verifiable. Um, but I'm, I'm going to be looking at first and second order theories in this talk. So let's talk about the first order theory. Uh, so S12, um, here we have, it's a theory where variables range over integers. Uh, there's terms like zero successor plus and times as usual. There's also a few other terms in particular, the smash function, uh, x smash y is equal to two to the length of x times the length of y. It gives you polynomial growth rate functions here. Uh, length of x means the number of bits in the binary representation of, of x. It has bounded quantifiers for all x less than or equal to t, exists x less than or equal to t. And then it's got these very special sharply bounded quantifiers for all x less than or equal length of t, exists x less than or equal length of t. So think of length as being the log function. Uh, so sharply bounded quantifiers are ranging over much smaller domains. So in particular, you can think of the sharply bounded quantifiers are ranging over such a small set of integers that it's feasible to exhaustively check every single one. If you want to check whether for all x less than or equal t, some property holds, you can just enumerate all of those values of x and check each one, and you still stay within the complexity class of, in this case, poly polynomial time. Uh, we then define classes of formulas, sigma bi and pi bi, by counting the alternation of bounded quantifiers and ignoring sharply bounded quantifiers. Sorry, hit a button by mistake. Um, and the sigma b1 formulas express exactly the NP predicates, the non-deterministic pol polynomial time predicates. Uh, for higher levels of alternation, we express exactly the predicates at the ith level of the polynomial time hierarchy. And S12 was given polynomial induction, PN for short. There's other versions of length induction, which are equivalent. Uh, and I've written the length induction formula here at the bottom of the screen, because it's the most familiar form to you is if a of zero holds and if for all x, a of x implies a of x plus one, then for all x, a holds of the length of x. So you notice that length there, this is just induction up to small numbers. So small numbers are ones that are bounded by the log of x and so forth. So, so this is the ingredients that went into S12 and this particular form, formulation, uh, it's a little scary, but this was in my PhD thesis more years ago than I care to mention, but the date is at the top of the screen. So it's been a while. Um, and so uh, this is one of the canonical, again, it's a lot of the basic stuff went from Steve Cook, but not the first order version of it. Um, so this, and then the properties this has, and this is the kind of things that fit into the triad, the provably total functions of S12 uh, are precisely the polynomial time computable functions. And this is equivalent, at least, can be said as the, the functions provable S12 
uh, in the following sense of S12 can prove a Turing machine computes the function and halts within polynomial time and outputs the value of the function. Uh, S12 also enjoys the, the so-called Cook translation of any polynomial identity or sigma or, or universal property provable in S12 has a natural translation to a family of propositional formulas. And these formulas have polynomial size extended Frege proofs. Um, I won't give you the definition of extended Frege here explicitly, but a Frege proof is one that has modus ponens as its main inference rule. The extension rule allows introducing new variables as abbreviations for more complex formulas. And as such, it allows each line in the proof to be a Boolean circuit in effect, instead of a Boolean formula. So typically when you think of a uh, propositional proof system, you think of each line as a Boolean formula, but in an extended Frege proof, you can think of each line as a Boolean circuit. Um, and then this theory S12 proves the consistency of extended Frege. And furthermore, any propositional proof system, which is provably consistent in this theory, is polynomially simulated by extended Frege. So this means that really S12 really corresponds in a very strong way to the extended Frege proof system. You can think of extended Frege proofs as the non-uniform version of S12, or S12 as the uniform version of extended Frege proofs. So in some sense, bounded arithmetic is just propositional logic in disguise because of this very close connection, or can be at least. Bound, uh, pro pro propositional logic in, in, in disguise just because of this. And the further uh, connection then is that the lines in a proof, uh, an extended Frege proof, correspond to Boolean circuits. Uh, this was made explicit by Yarabek Yer some years ago, where he actually literally put Boolean circuits in his lines. But more generally, when you have the extended Frege proof, a formula with the extension variables in it, can be unwound easily and readily into a Boolean circuit. And the circuit value problem is complete for P. And so the lines in an extended Frege proof are exactly the non-uniform polynomial time properties. So, um, so let's see, like Monica wrote, I do love questions. Um, so feel free to jump in at any time. You can just type in the chat window, it won't stop the flow. And I'll be just, I'll be very happy if you ask a question. Um, so here's the picture again. Uh, and these theories for first order theories of arithmetic, this works well for classes like P. It works, actually it works well for classes that are at the level of NC2 or higher. So NC2 means it's so-called NC for Nick's class. Um, it's given by um, polynomial size circuits of, of logs, of, well, log square depth. Uh, don't worry too much about that. But there's, and, and what I just, the picture here just outlines what I had on the previous slide. There's the theory S12, which is the first order theory of bounded arithmetic. The provably total functions are the poly polynomial time functions and the extended Frege uh, proofs have proof lines that are Boolean circuits, which are non-uniform polynomial time properties. Can people see if I wave my mouse around on the screen? I see some nods. Okay, so I can't actually wave things at you. Good. Okay, so that was so this works pretty good for NC2. Now, going below NC2 gets harder. There, there has been some work I'm not going to discuss, discuss by people like uh, well, Steve, Steve, Steve Block and Bill Allen have pushed a little bit below NC2, but it, it gets difficult to go very much below NC2. And to, but part of the philosophy of bound arithmetic unlike a lot of proof theory is we're not going up to stronger and stronger theories. We're going down to weaker and weaker theories. So it's sort of going the opposite direction. So we would like to go down into weaker theories than even NC2. Below NC2, there's things like alternating log time and log space and NL and TC0 and things like this that are all, well, these are all open questions. They could, it could be that everything is equal to each other you know, if P were equal to NP and a lot of other things also collapsed, it could be that all these complexity classes I mentioned in the talk are equal to each other. So nobody knows, but uh, we conjecture not at least. So to go down lower, uh, there's been a lot of work on this. I've written the names of a lot of people who contributed to this at the top. Uh, you go to second order theories of bounded arithmetic. So, <clears throat> At first glance, this sounds odd because typically second order theories are stronger than first order theories. 
But in fact, the second order theories are designed to be weaker than the first order theories. And one thing, what happens here, I'll describe a little bit on the next slides, is that instead of working with sharply bounded quantifiers to range over small objects and bounded quantifiers to range over quote large objects, we'll now instead use first order quantifiers to range over small objects and second order quantifiers to range over big objects. So people keep phoning me. Um, so uh, it's like I never get any phone calls and three non-spam calls came in the last 20 minutes. It's remarkable. <laughs> okay, so back to the talk here. Um, so we're gonna work with second order theories and we're now gonna work with the analogous kind of consequences. Uh, instead of looking at the, at the universal consequences, as I described before, the, the, the analogy here is for all sig sigma B zero co consequences. This means universal second order quantifiers followed by bounded first order quantifiers. And those will have propositional translations and correspond to some proof system. Uh, in these proof systems that are used in practice, the proof lines correspond to some type of restricted Boolean circuit. And for the provably total functions on the other side at the bottom left, we're looking at the for all exists sigma B zero co con consequences. So the for all, this means for all second order objects, there exists a second order object such that some uh, bounded properties apply to it. And this would be the provably total functions here will take as input second order objects and the output of the function will also be a second order object. So we're still mapping large things to large things, but now the large things are second order objects. So here in more detail is what's going on. Uh, second order theories, I already said a lot of this. First order objects that now play the role of sharply bounded objects, the small objects. Second order objects play the role of larger objects and they're the inputs and the outputs to functions. Uh, the base, there's a base theory V0 um, that has comprehension and, and induction. I'm, I'm changing, I'm rewriting history a little bit here, but has comprehension and induction for bounded first order formulas with free second order variables uh, that are implicitly universally quantified. Um, the syntax here is uh, first order bounded quantifiers have the form for all x less than or equal t exists x less than or equal t. This ranges over small things we call integers. Second order quantifiers, and we use capital letters like ca capital X, range, oh, there's an exist that should be a for all there. I should update my slides before Monica posts them for me afterwards. Um, these range over large objects. And then we have, uh, going down to the next to last line on the screen, we have first order arithmetic operations, zero successor, that's plus one, predecessor is minus one, plus times less than or equal to equals. Um, and then we also have two other things special for the second order objects. We write X in Y, first order object X as a member of second order object Y, or just write Y of X usually for set membership. And uh, the, we often, a lot of the ways the theories is done, we use a maximal element. Length of X is the maximal element in X. Um, and this is, we're thinking of the second order objects as finite sets of integers. So this gives us the largest element. And uh, the sigma B zero formulas are the formulas that have bounded first order quantifiers, no unbounded first order quantifiers and no second order quantifiers at all. And then the axioms for V zero, uh, we have axioms defining the properties of the first order functions there's a boundedness axiom that says that this is the, the, the finiteness. For an arbitrary second order object, capital A, there's a Y such that for all X, A of X holds only for X less than or equal to Y. And the, and the minimization axiom is the, well, this is just the dual of the induction. If A of B holds, then there's some minimal X uh, where A of X holds and A does not hold for any and another typo here, y less than x. Uh, not y less than or equal to x, that wouldn't make any sense. Okay. And then the, the big axiom is comprehension, sigma b0 co comprehension. For a sigma b0 formula phi, uh, there's a second order object x that is equivalent to phi of y on a bounded domain less than or equal to a. 
So some, somebody asked in the chat, when you say integer, should we understand a non-negative integer? So yes, integer means non-negative integer. As, as a logician, I start with zero, not with one. I hope that all of you follow the same convention. Uh, so it's zero, one, two, three, and so on. Um, like I said earlier, we can also think of these things as strings. So we can think of the second order object in, as a set of integers. We can, you know, if, if set or object as a, say it's got the members one, three, and seven in it, you can think of this as the bi binary string one, zero, zero, one, zero, one, zero, or something like that. It would be the integer two to the one plus two to the three plus two to the seven. I think I got an extra zero or two in there when I, when I said it. Um, and uh, so we can think of the second order objects as strings uh, with the ones indicating the members, uh, I should say, we're saying the second order objects as bin binary strings with the ones indicating the presence of a non-negative integer in the set. And uh, the length of the binary strings are the small integer, are, 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 are the first order objects. So this gives us a maybe a bit more direct connection to the computer science point of view of working with strings instead of integers. Uh, but in some sense, strings are the same as integers, as we well, well know all the way from Gerbil, because you can code integers with strings and vice versa, right? So what I've described so far then is the theory for V0, the base theory. And then, uh, oh yes, and Lev corrected my less than or equal to the strictly less than. I think I mentioned that already. Thank you, though. Um, that was up here for all y strictly less than x. That's the base theory. And then there's theories for L and NL. Um, and these are coming up next. Um, so this is due to, I can't see the top of my screen anymore, but Zambell, I guess, did the first one. Per, uh, Perron in his theses and published work. And, and Cook and Nguyen, both in an early paper by Ice Nguyen and Cook, and in the book by Cook and Nguyen. Uh, so this is a theory, VL is a theory for log space functions. So the provably total functions are exactly the log space computable functions. This means a Turing machine that's space restricted to use only logarithmic space with space, this log of the length of the input, sorry, the yeah, log of the length of the in input space is allowed in the work tape areas. And the Cook translation goes to a theory called GL star. Um, and this works on a class of formulas called sigma C and F2. I'm not sure I really want to say what those are, but say something in the chat window if you want me to, I guess. Uh, the C and F2 formulas were introduced by Jan Johansson, are complete for L, and then sig sigma C and F2 is a, is a generalization of this to existentially quantified versions of formulas. And the log bounded recursion is written here. This is an axiom. It's a big three line mess. So let me try to wave my hands about what it means. We've got a formula A of X, Y, and we're talking about looking for path in a graph. So I've got a graph with, it's a directed graph with edges. And A of X, Y means there's an edge from X to Y. And the graph has out degree at least one. So every vertex has at least one out, outgoing edge. And without loss of generality, we can just assume this is a single out, outgoing edge because we could always, uh, because we're allowed first order bounded quantifiers for free, we could just pick out the minimal Y for each X and let that, that be the, the next step. That we want to say from this directed graph, we think of starting a path at the node zero and then following the path according to the predicate uh, A of XY, giving the, giving the possible edges. Um, and uh, XIY means that Y is the ith vertex in the path. So the axiom here, I guess I'll let you parse it out, says that there's exactly one ith vertex on the path for each I. And the path has length b. B is a is a free variable, so it means you can extend this path as far as you wish. And so this path is log space complete. And the proof of that is basically you think of the config the, con the configurations of a log space bounded Turing machine are the nodes in the graph, and the a predicate, the outgoing edges, are just the permissible single steps of the Turing machine. And um, Jan's corrected me; he didn't introduce CNF two. He just showed there satisfiability is complete. Okay, uh, CNF2 means that, uh, what is it, let me see, CNF2 means no, well, 
no, no, oh, no variable occurs more than occurs more than twice in the entire form formula, right? Okay. Um, okay. At any rate, so that was this. This work was done by the Zambella, Peron, Cook, Nguyen, and uh, Zambella gave the axiom originally, and so forth. And then um, there's also a theory for VNL. This is non-deterministic log space. So we've got a log space Turing machine that can make non-deterministic moves. And so uh, the, let's be a little careful about what that means. So NL is, is on the face of it, a, a not defining functions, but relations. But the provably total functions that we're interested in are the polynomial growth rate functions, single valued functions, whose graph is, whose bit graph, that means the, whether the ith bit of the output of the function is true or not, is an NL predicate. Okay, and then the Cook translations is a, another kind of prop, a propositional proof system based on sigma crom formulas. Uh, this was due to um, uh, Gradle, so this class sig, sig, sigma crom formulas is due to Gradle, and it's a class of quantified Boolean formulas that are complete for NL. Uh, again, I don't really want to get into details on the definitions. And the, the key axiom here is graph reachability or, or, con or connectivity. Uh, again, the axiom is written out here. It's a little bit long to actually try to read all those symbols, but the intuition is the following. A of x, y says there's a directed edge from x to y. It's a possible step for a path. It's no longer deterministic. There can definitely be more than one possible outgoing edge. Uh, there should be at least one. And x, i, y says that y is reachable from the starting node zero in at most i steps. And again, you can think of this with a non-deterministic Turing machine. Let the vertices of the graph that we're taking, looking at paths on be the configurations of the Turing machine. Since it's a log space on a Turing machine, there's only polynomially many con configurations, hence only polynomially many nodes in the graph. And then it's a non-deterministic Turing machine. So it, at various places, it can actually move in different directions as a valid step. And we're just asking, for instance, is, the final, is there an accepting configuration that's reachable from the initial configuration? And so in that way, this reachability predicate is in fact NL complete. And there's a whole bunch of theories here. I feel like I'm running a little low on time, so I'm gonna go very fast on this slide here. Um, there's a bunch of theories here that have been done within this framework. Um, I've only listed some of them. Um, for the top block of six theories, these are all in the framework I talked about first with first order theories uh, for P and for poly polynomial local search and colored polynomial local search and the local improvement principles. Uh, and then actually there's, for the stronger theories, P space next time, these are actually second order theories again, but now we're moving into stronger complexity classes, which I've gone back to second order theories. And then below the line, I've listed three of the theories that are used for the second type of second order systems of, arith of arithmetic. Uh, BNC1 for alternating log time, and I just described VL and VNL. Um, so it's been quite a bit of work in these areas and this is only part of it, but I think I wanna move on to keep my talk a reasonable length. But the slides will be available. I believe the slides should be available online. So I just wanted to mention this is work in prog progress here. Uh, we've done the first part of it, but not the second part of it. But I still wanted to talk about it a little bit just to see what's going on with alternative approaches for propositional theories for VL and VNL. Uh, these these theory these classes sigma CNF two and sigma crom are they're I must say they're indirectly connected to log space and non-deterministic log space, and. Steve, had actually Steve Cook had actually suggested at one point using a more direct connection uh, based on branching programs for representing log space or non-deterministic log space uh, properties. And so this is, this is in the direction that, that Cook made. Uh, he actually suggested in the setting of uh, pro prover liar games uh, in work of Pudlock and myself as the type of games but um, we're not doing that here. We're just taking the branching programs idea. Um, and so we have, these are propositional theories. We're not doing first order or second order theories at the moment. These are new 
propositional theories. They're going to replace the GL star and the GNL star. Uh, and the lines in these prop propositional proofs are either going to be branching programs, deterministic branching programs, and I'll call these EDT formulas, or non-deterministic branching programs, uh, ENDT for formulas. And branching programs are the the non-uniform version of log space and non-deterministic branching programs are the non-determinist are the sorry non-uniform version of non-deterministic log space. And just to get what all these letters mean, DT means decision tree. E EDT for extension decision tree allows extension variables, which basically makes the decision tree into a decision DAG, a decision directed acyclic graph, uh, which in other words, is a, is a branching pro program. So, um, so let's see, I have a picture of a decision tree. I don't have a picture of a decision program here, but I've got a decision trees are pictured here. And the top of the definition, here's the definition of decision tree form, formulas. An atomic formula is either a variable P or a negated variable P, P, P overline. And depending on which version of the language you're using, may or may or may not allow the constants zero and one for false and true. And there's a single connective uh, for these formulas, which is we write phi p psi. This is the decision connective or the case connective or the if then else connective. And phi p psi means, you know, if p then psi else phi. In other words, you look at p or let's do the case. You say if p is true, the value of this formula is psi. If p is false, the value of this formula is phi. Okay, so again, if p then psi else phi, right? And that's written phi p psi. Another way to think about this is you're looking at this formula, you test whether p is true or false. If it's false, you go left and evaluate phi. If it's true, you go right and evaluate psi. Okay. And here's a couple pictures of a very simple formula. Uh, here's Q bar P parentheses QQR. And I've written the picture here, the, the zeros and ones mean, you know, you, you test P if it's false, you go on the edge labeled zero. If it's true, you go on the edge labeled one. And if you end up at a, a node, a leaf, then you just take the value of the variable there. And over here, I've done the same thing with explicitly putting the true falses on the end. So here, Q bar, evaluates the formula, you know, if Q, then zero else one, right? So case, the one, one Q zero is the same as Q, Q bar. R is the same as zero one R. And then some trickiness pulled here where the Q appears in the context of having already tested Q. So you can just put a zero there because you know, if you get to this node, you know Q is false, right? So that's decision trees, very simple minded, not much going on with them. And, but this is the form, but it gives a very simple set of formulas. And then the, okay, we're a proof theory. I have to put some Genson sequence calculus things in the talk. So here we go. Uh, here's the Genson sequence calculus for this is we have the usual initial sequence. You can imagine what they are. Weak inferences and cut rule. I think everyone knows what those are. And then we've got the decision connective rules. And there's a pair of rules for the left and the right. Uh, De de decision left and decision right that introduce these connectives. So let's look at the decision right one here. So A, P, B, let me see if I can say this without messing it up. This means that um, if P is true, then B holds. And if P is false, then A holds. So think of this as hiding an and in there. So if the first part was if P is true, then B holds. So P implies B. And the second part was that if P is false, then A holds. So if you move the P over here and have P bar comma arrows A, right? So that makes sense, okay? It's tricky to think about these things, but okay, good. And then um, extent, no, that's, this is, well, so far I've just done decision trees. I haven't talked about decision DAGs or branching programs. So for branching programs, we, I mentioned extended Frege earlier. And so we use the extension idea to introduce variables that stand for nodes in a branching program. So this is very much the way extension variables are used in Frege or in extended Frege systems. Uh, if we reuse a, a node to make something into a circuit instead of a formula, 
we can introduce a variable that stands for the value of that node. So if there's a formula, sub, sub formula phi that's getting used multiple times in a larger formula, we introduce a new variable E, set it equivalent to phi with a new axiom or pair of axioms. And uh, then we, anywhere we want to reuse the formula phi, we instead use the variable E. So this way, decision trees become decision DAGs. And that's the same as just another way of saying a decision branching pro programs or br branching programs. And uh, we allow new initial sequence E arrows phi and phi arrows E, just to say they're equivalent. And we allow extension variables to be used as atomic formulas, but we do not allow them to be used as decision literals. Right, so you can't test E and then branch left to right based on the value of E. You can only use E as the leaf of one of those trees that I wrote there. And that's because if you allow them to be used as decision literals, you would immediately get all the way back to extent to extended Frege. You can immediately discuss Boolean circuits and so on. So that would be too strong. The unnegated part's not so crucial here. It will be crucial in the next slide. Here, that doesn't make any difference whether or not we allow negation. And then, an ELDT proof is a sequence of sequence of EDT formulas inferred using the sequence calculus rules. Uh, the, such proofs are used in conjunction with the defining equations for the extension variables. The evaluation of a truth value of an EDT formula is log space complete. So every line of an ELDT proof expresses a non-uniform log space property. And the theorem then, we get this sort of triad of results again, is, uh, we haven't, fully written up the details, but the, it's, the proof is fairly, fairly straightforward, although technically rather involved. The, the for all sigma B zero consequences, that's these universal consequences of VL, have natural propositional translations into um, EDT formulas, which have polynomial size ELDT proofs. So, and very uniform, they're, they're log space uniform ELDT proofs. Um, VL can prove the consistency of this theory, ELDT, and any propositional proof system which is VL provably sound is P simulated by ELDT. So ELDT is the, the uh, strongest theory that VL can prove consistent. Um, the, the, the remaining part of the, the uh, triad here I didn't mention is the provably total functions of the VL are exactly the log space functions, but that we already know from the, the prior work. The new part here is the new proof system. ELDT. And that's the results for VL. We have analogous results for VNL, which I'll cover just a little bit here. So for non-deterministic, oh wait, there's a rule here. Someone asked a nice question. Can you use a form of substitution rule instead of extension axioms as for Frege systems? Not that I'm aware of. Um, that's I have not thought about that question, but not that I'm aware of. The extension axioms allow us to um, express more on each line, the substitution rule would allow us to infer more. And um, I, I haven't thought about that. It's a great question, but I haven't thought about it. Um, and then non-deterministic uh, setting is the following. N, NDT and ENDT formulas are defined exactly like the earlier, the justifying DT and EDT formulas, but we also allow ORs, dis, disjunction. So this corresponds to the non-uniformity. So think of the decision tree. You're, I was gonna wave my hands, but you can barely see me on the screen. With, with the decision tree, you're, tra you're traversing the decision tree and you reach a literal P and then you de deterministically branch either left or right, depending on whether P is true or false. With an OR, you can non-deterministically go left or right. And as long as there's some sequence of choices that lead to acceptance, then the formula evaluates to true. So this is how the or corresponds to non-determinism. Um, so NDT formulas then are non-deterministic decision trees and ENDT formula gives you non-deterministic branching programs. Again, a branching program would be, a non-deterministic branching program is like a regular branching program, but it has non-deterministic gates, also called or gates, where you can branch either way. Evaluating an ENDT formula is complete for non-deterministic log space. And again, you can just think of a non-deterministic branching program can be formed for a non from a non-deterministic log space Turing machine by letting the nodes in the branching program correspond to 
configurations of the log space Turing machine. There's only polynomially many such nodes. And then the, um, each, each operation of the log space machine is either testing in input uh, bit to, and doing something or is non-deterministically moving, in which case we have an OR gate. And then we have the e ELNDT proofs are Genson sequence calculus proof with ENDT formulas in the sequence. And the permitted rules of inference are the ones I listed earlier, including the decision rule, plus the usual Genson rules for OR, which I don't need to list for this audience. You all know those rules, right? So I hope, if not, it's a great time to learn the Genson sequence calculus. Um, and then the theorem for this, these results are that for all sigma B zero consequences of V and L have their, their propositional translations are also E NDT formulas or sequence of E NDT formulas and they have polynomial size E L NDT proofs. V and L proves the consistency of E L NDT and it's the strongest proof system which is provably sound in V and L in the sense of any proof system that VNL proves consistent is P simulated by ELNDT. Um, this is also work in progress. We're still, this is a little more in progress than the previous results, but in particular, we need to reprove the Imran Schlepcheny theorem on the fact that NL is closed under com complement. This is known to be provable in VNL, but the current proofs are a little roundabout. So we're hoping to get a, a more direct, ele elegant proof. In particular, we should be able to, what we certainly can do is get from induction on things with reachability, we can iterate, we can, it, we can iteratively nest reachability definitions, and we still have induction on everything that's reached there. And that can be done even proving a restricted version of the Ehrman Schlepp Cheney theorem. You don't need to even prove the full Ehrman Schlepp Cheney theorem to make that happen. So this is still very much work in progress here, but I'm, we're confident it's going to work out. Um, and I'm done. Thank you for, I'll say, attending uh, or whatever. Thank you for showing up online. And uh, again, I really appreciate your coming and having the chance to speak. So uh, great. Thank you. First of all, everyone for applaud or uh, show your hands in the Zoom. Are there any questions here? So just speak out. So while you're thinking of your questions, let me just suggest an open question, an open question that's yeah. that's not done, that's been, you know, bugging me for decades, literally, is if you go back to the definition of S12, there was P induction and L induction. And you'll notice there was nothing in those induction axioms that said anything directly about polynomial time. The, po the polynomial time came out sort of naturally from the induction axioms. And obviously induction axioms are very natural principles. <coughs> so on the other hand, for all these theories in the second order setting, uh, the axioms are things like introducing, if you go back to the, let me see if I can do this. If you go back to the, to the axioms here for say recursion of Zambella, we're saying here, you know, basically the predicate A is un is universally quantified. You're saying that for all A's that satisfy this property, there is an X. So the axiom is explicitly talking about the existence of a predicate, and it's a predicate which is log space complete. So these theories all work along the principle <coughs> of add an axiom that introduces a complete function for the complexity class that you're targeting. And then uh, using Herobrand's theorem to say <coughs> that in fact you get all the functions in that targeted class and nothing but the functions. So my question would be that, as I said, I've been thinking about wishing sort of wish list for decades is, can we get axioms that don't explicitly bring in the existence of a complete function, but instead implicitly define it via some more usual logical principles versus computational principles. Um, I wanted to mention something uh, about that. Uh, Dr. Lavant has a very, very, Dr. Daniel Lavant has a very, very old 
paper uh, in second order logic uh, proving that if you allow uh, quantification only for existential second order formulas, you could get P time out of it. Is that the kind of uh, thing you had in mind? Yeah, that is that is the kind of thing I have in mind. Yeah, we'd like to get that for weaker classes too, right? <laughs> and Antonina asked a very nice question, which is, uh, we are we are implicitly going through transitive closure here. So what's in so the question was how do you reprove immersive subtraining? And Antonina had the by the way I didn't don't think I fully I put her initial in here various places, but I didn't cite this as explicitly as I could have. Um, but she she's the K that appears at various places in the talk. Um, uh, <coughs> so we do. It's not like a really new proof. We still go through some sort of transitive closure, of course, explicitly. The the thing here is that, um, I mean, the basic property is the following. The basic thing to get around is you've got a, you've got a path going through a, a graph and you'd like to know that something's not reachable by a path. So if something is reachable by a path, you just say, well, there exists a path law and it's good. But you want something's not reachable by a path. Uh, you, this just even, I guess, the negation is already the issue there. So implicitly you have to count the number of reachable nodes Right, so you want to say there's some maximum number of reachable nodes, and then if something's not in that maximum number of reachable nodes, then it's not reachable. And you do that by saying, you know, that you count the number of nodes. You want to know if node x is if node x is reachable, and you know the maximum number of reachable nodes is m. You count that there's at least m reachable nodes other than x, and then you know x is not reachable. And this can be done with counting, um, but uh, I don't want to say the proof is essentially different than what. Uh, the earlier proofs were, but um, it's really is it's not really essentially different. But you can short circuit some of the work by just using the fact that we have minimization or max or maximization, so you can talk about the maximum number uh, of steps before something gets reachable. You say what's the maximal length so that something is reachable in i steps, uh, and not i plus one steps, right? Okay. So uh, that's beautiful. Okay. So yeah, so the, the results, the, the first proof of the image sub theorem is in Antonina's paper with, with Steve, right? With Steve Cook, I think is a joint. And um, it's, it's, there's a, a bit of a redo it in a paper of Peron, but then it's not done in the Cook Nguyen book. Cook Nguyen uh, talk about it, but they never actually prove the result. Just so it's it's not an easy proof. It's a pretty difficult proof to do. So it would be nice to get something a little more straightforward. And it's been the proof has been floating around about what 15 years or something like that. It's time for an easier proof of this. <laughs> um, right. Uh, there's also a lot of related questions which Antonita can ask better than I can. I got this from her. Things like SL versus L and so forth, triangles theorem, what what things are provable where in bounded arithmetic. Some very, some very nice questions there. Uh, let me see. So there are two more questions in the chat. Ah, so let's see. Frederick asks, bound arithmetic theories that have only finitely many variables instead of infinite number of variables. Um, is it ever interesting? No one's done this before. I mean, this is related to your thinking here of the results in, in, in finite model theory. So no one's done anything of this type before. So uh, it would be delightful to see something interesting happening there um, in the I guess one question would be whether in bounded arithmetic in the propositional side of things it makes a difference or not too. Um, you know, no one's no one's looked at that at all, and that is another big open, open question here would be to integrate the bounded arithmetic approach, which is really based on provability and proofs, with the finite model theory approach, which is based on expressibility. Those are not. I guess there's been some results combining these, but I would say. Uh, Nothing, nothing that's really widely accepted, I guess. And mm -hmm. Lev asks, are there exponential versions of these systems? So, so yes, um, there are, ex there, or sorry, are there equational versions of these systems? Yeah, so yes, yes, there, yes, there, there, there are equational versions. Um, some of my earlier slides mentioned PV and S12. So P, PV was what Steve Cook did originally, is an equational theory for poly polynomial time. Uh, he was very much influenced, I believe, by equational theories for primitive recursive arithmetic and his relation to I, sig I sigma one. But these theories, VL and VNL, this, they all have equational versions as well, where you 
you take the like the Zambella's re, uh, recursion axiom, log bound recursion axiom. <coughs> you introduce all the all the log space com computable functions. You then uh, throw away the recursion axioms, and you're left with an equational theory. And um, they may not quite phrase it as equational theories, but it's essentially equational theory, so it could easily be converted in, in, into one. So maybe I should say the mo it's morally the answer is yes. I'm not sure they've actually got purely equational versions of these theories. Um, Martin Dowd, a long time ago, had a purely equational version PSA of P space arithmetic back in the um, late 70s or early 80s, I guess, um, that predated U12 and so on. I may have mentioned that on that slide I skipped uh, earlier. Up, up, uh, yeah, so if you look at this line here, PSA is an equational theory and student Martin Dowd. Okay. Okay. But yeah, okay. So you mentioned before that Antonina has more questions, more open questions to that problem we were discussing earlier. Are they written down somewhere in a paper or is it? Uh, Antonina, do you want to feel that one? Yeah. Um, well, I think I, uh, some of them should be in the CSL, the old CSL paper, but uh, basically, of the things that are still open is whether symmetric log space, which was proven using expander's technique to be equivalent to log space, whether this, uh, whether it's actually formalizable in the theory or whether the theory for symmetric log space is, uh, is not the same as the theory for log space. And theory of symmetric log space is kind of weird. We couldn't quite get the same closure results in others. So that theory as for theory for NL. So that's so if I could just clarify and answer this comment, she's talking about symmetric log space, which maybe not everyone's familiar with. Symmetric log space is where the, you're you're traversing an undirected graph instead of a directed graph. So you can think of it, the Turing machine doesn't just have a forward direction, it can also freely move backwards. Uh, and so the question is reachability in symmetric log space versus reach in a, in an undirected graph versus reachability in a directed graph. And these are equivalent, uh, but um, it's not known whether these facts are provable in any particular theory of bound arithmetic, at least not at this low level. Right. Okay, thank you. Anyone else does any have any questions? Hopefully I didn't overlook any raised hands or so, because you, I know you can do that in Zoom. There's another one in the chat now. So, oh, so yeah, there's several intuitionistic, so the question of, are there intuitionic versions of these talks, of these systems? Um, and so there are some bounded versions of intuitionistic logic. There's, there's a, let me see if I can get the history right. There's an IS-1-2, that I did in the like 1986 or something like that is an intuitionistic version of S12. There was PB Omega, which um, uh, Cook and Urquhart did a sort of higher order type system. So think of HA Omega, Heiting Arithmetic Omega, I, IPB Omega, I guess they called it, was an in, in, intuitionistic version of higher type system that also has this property of, um, defining the polynomial time functions. The intuitionistic systems have the following property of you can ask for what, what formula, if you can prove for all X, there exists Y phi, where phi is an arbitrary formula, maybe bounded or something like that. If it's intuitionistically provable, then Y is a function, as a polynomial time function of X without needing to put so many restrictions on the formula phi that defines the graph of the function. Um, and there's been, uh, okay, you've caught me off guard with this question. There's been a number of follow-up papers of some, uh, some Kripke model results and so forth. Um, Har Harnick, I think, had a paper and there's a couple other papers as well, uh, but I've, I'm blanking on the names right now. If, you, if, you're, if, if you're interested, send me a note and I can try to look them up for you. But for the weaker systems, the the second order systems, no, I don't think anyone's done anything with intuitionistic systems for these.
And IS-12, just to finish up on that question, IS-12 did use a notion of realizability. Um, actually, my original proof of the polynomial time functions for S-12 used realizability. So I wrote it up, but then I realized that a witnessing type proof was actually much simpler and more direct. So I someplace have the handwritten notes of that from 1984, I think. But, you know, I don't think there's that much interest. So in what sense was it easier because it was more direct? Well, it was easier because I think with the, the, the realizability, I had to prove everything. For some reason, I'm trying to remember, I had to prove everything twice. So I think I had to prove that, um, what was it exactly? I felt, I think I did double the work. So I had two, two chapters of material for realizability and turned into one chapter of material the same length as the, the two, mm -hmm. yeah, each one for, for witnessing. Um, yeah, well, but I'm blanking now on what it was actually. But yes, I had to prove had to prove everything. You know, had to prove everything twice for some reason. Uh, as a truth based version of realizability, I use. I'm pretty sure. So there is another no, another comment. There is no need for higher types in the direct witnessing proofs. That's why. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. That's, yeah, good, yeah. Okay. So in case there is no other uh, question in the audience somewhere, shout now, use your opportunity if you have one. Um, I would say we all thank um, Sam once more for this. So. And thank, thank you for uh, inviting me and listening a lot. So. <laughs>